Good afternoon. I'm the Reverend Julie Ann Lepp, and it is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon as we celebrate the life of Carol Johnson. And we are going to have a number of uh, people who loved and cared for Carol sharing in this service some of her poetry and memories and words that lift up her beautiful life. And our first words this morning are from Kali Dasa. These are our opening words. Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief, brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream and tomorrow is only a vision, but today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. I'm going to light the chalice this morning and I'm going to read a piece by Paul Robertson, which is also in your service. Um, if you'd like to read along with me, our chalice for today. I shall take my voice wherever there are those who want to hear the melody of freedom or the words that might inspire hope and courage in the face of despair and fear. My weapons are peaceful, for it is only by peace that peace can be attained. The song of freedom must prevail. So I think you can hear me now. Yep. Okay. Good. This is a reading uh, by Sophia Lyon Foss. Uh, Some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days and fears of unknown calamities. Other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating saved from unsaved, friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Other beliefs are like gateways, opening wide vistas for exploration. Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth of resourcefulness. Other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal worth. Some beliefs are rigid, like the body of death, impotent, in a changing world. Other beliefs are pliable, like the young sapling, ever growing with the upward thrust of life. Today we honor, remember, and celebrate Carol Johnson 
There is a Buddhist blessing that says, joyfully participate in the sorrows of life. We are a part of cycles and seasons. Sorrow and joy are intertwined like the day and the night. At such times, the various faiths that sustain us separately come together in a harmony that acts across all creeds and assures us of the permanence of human goodness and hope. Carol traveled quite a bit. She married Frederick Johnson called Tick and had a print shop on Water Street, which is now the Truckers Union. They had two sons, Benji and Eric. She had fond memories of watching her children in the doll and pet parade. It was a big deal, they dressed up. One dressed as a hunter and the other walked the dog. <laughs> as a family, they went to the Chippewa Flowage, had a mobile home with friends. They would get together each summer and go every weekend fishing for muskies, even when the children were babies. Carol was a big book lover and if you had a chance to hear her talk about books, you, you know she had lots of opinions on her books. And she loved history. Uh, she was a sickly child and was home often. Her mother would buy her books to keep her entertained. Carol was active for many years in the Democratic Party in Eau Claire. She volunteered quite often and went to the coffee clutch. Carol loved writing poetry and of which you'll hear some of her work in today's service. She also loved writing in Jan Carroll's poetry group at UUC. She said to me, I think in terms of poetry now. When I visited her in hospice, she continued to talk about poetry and how much she loved Mary Oliver being read to her. Carol traveled to Ireland, France, Turkey, and all over the United States. She was interested in battlefields and visiting reservations in the Southwest. She was also interested in how war affected America and the world. Every place she traveled, she loved the people. She said that she had learned in her life that people who look different than her have a body and a brain and thoughts similar to hers. And this is something that she wrote. It, it was on a piece of paper that she gave me and it says, this I believe. I bring my world into existence, live it out and take it with me when I die. Everything I encounter is my life. Anything that appears before me is just the scenery of my life. She also wanted me to share this with you. And she said, Unitarians, I feel privileged to belong to this congregation where the members support social justice and are talented and smart. Sitting in the back pew, I listen to our wonderful choir and I know how lucky I am to be a member of this congregation. You are family to me. You supported me through the losses of, ch of children and a friend. Carol, we celebrate you today. We give thanks for the re relationships and love that Carol shared with those gathered here in this virtual space among us and, and with us even now in our thoughts and memories. Let us express gratitude for the days and years that were shared with her. We are here to remember and memorialize a mother, a friend, a poet, a lover of art and music, a lover of nature, a person with wide opinion and a good woman. Hello, hello everyone. Um, I'm Ruth Lovejoy and I, I was honored to be in the poetry group with Carol and to be reading this first poem called First Encounter, written by Carol Johnson in 2019. First Encounter, there he is smiling at me from his 1957 pickup truck. Seeing him the thought came to me that he would be a good father. The bulldog on the passenger seat is wearing sunglasses. The man's smile is infectious. A touch 
of grace in his life. He was a good father and he brought joy to my life. It's a poem about her husband, Tick. Thank you. Hi, I'm the Reverend Virginia Wolf, and I'm going to read another poem by Carol. It's called The uh, Music. Listening to Leonard Cohen brings memories. When he sings, I'm your man, I pick up the broom and dance, making a pass now and then. He sings to me from a window in the tower of song, and I swoon. Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska brings memories of yesterday when he sings, there's nothing better than blood on blood. I am alone with Pink Floyd's The Wall and have grown comfortably numb. Hello, I'm Jeff Smith, and I wouldn't be who I am and where I am without the friends that I've had around me um, and lifted me up. And one of those is Carol. Carol put into words um, her activism, and this is one of those that she handed me three years ago called Lead Pipe. It's a lead pipe cinch that children will suffer from lead poisoning. The lead pipes and painted windowsills, and walls will make them sick. City and state officials cite the high cost needed to solve the lead problem. Minorities are most affected. They live in old neighborhoods, in cities where Caucasians have escaped the suburban's safety. Here's what I say, get the lead out, do the right thing. <laughs> Hi, <clears throat> I'm Jan Carroll, and I had the honor to have Carol in my um, church poetry group for many years. She was a vibrant member. She always had really uh, thought-provoking questions on other people's poetry as well, well as present her own poetry. She and I also became friends um, going each month to listen to the music group Eggplant Heroes at um, the Acoustic Cafe here in town. Uh, we'd always sit together. I'm going to read a poem that I wrote for Carol called Song for Carol. I see you in vivid colors, a bit of a grin, a spark in your eyes, not a bounce in your step, but a groundedness born of sadness and joy long lived with. I see you unfolding a paper from your purse, holding it out to me, asking me to read the words you wrote in large font from true heart. I see you taking a sip of wine from your glass as we listen to music at acoustic, only chatting between songs, the songs themselves deserving our attention. I see you distraught over the world's condition, longing to help, but feeling helpless, aching for relief for the suffering. I see you almost childlike in wonder ready to speak the awe that struck you, ready to laugh, ready to say to me as a friend when you turned 80, I love you and kiss me on the cheek. Carlin, you'll want to unmute uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um. Jim, can you um, re-spotlight 
uh, Carlin and see if that'll prompt the unmuting. So Carlin, I think we're gonna um, come back to you in just a minute and um, go ahead and get uh, Tim to share and then I'll, I'll text with you and help you out, okay? Yeah. As as Jan suggested, Carol asked wonderful questions. A dozen years ago, the UU congregation offered an adult religious education class on the topic of soul. Mm -hmm. On the Sunday I announced the offering, Carol caught me after the service to ask if the class might be too intellectual for her. I think her question really was about the approach we might be taking. Would the class address mostly academic questions or would it deal with authentic real life issues? She enrolled in the class, so she must have been persuaded. One of her questions about soul was this one. Is it necessary for artists to suffer in order to have soul? <laughs> As someone who enjoyed theater, Carol wondered if an actor who had never herself lost a loved one could truly play the part of a grieving mother. In the soul class, Carol had quite a bit to say about the differences between an artist with true soul and one who had mastered the, te the techniques of pretending. When we asked her how she could tell she told us, quote, when I hear someone like Billie Holiday sing, I feel my teeth hurt, my upper molars on both sides. I can feel her suffering in my teeth when I hear her sing. When Carol came to Sunday morning services, she usually sat on the north side in the back of the sanctuary and from there, she could look up at Lori Beasy's big window, the one which includes her son's misky, mit, uh, musky lure. Here it is. You maybe have seen the musky lure, which is right here in this section of the window. Carol liked, th loved this window. I love it myself. And Lori called it, out of the universe we come. Maybe it was Carol's teeth telling her about the soul of Lori Beasy. For another adult RE class on the Sages of Concord, the participants planned a dramatic presentation of the sages for a Sunday morning service. The skit was set in 1842 in the home of Lydian and Ralph Waldo Emerson. All of the lines in the skit were selected from something the characters had written. They included the Emersons, Henry David Thoreau, Sophia and Elizabeth Peabody, Bronson and Louisa May Elcott, and Margaret Fuller. Carol wanted the part of Margaret. She thought maybe Bly Allen would want it too, or Dorothy Crow, but Bly chose Elizabeth Peabody and Dorothy played Thoreau. So Carol played Margaret Fuller. Her part came from Fuller's conversations with women. Here are some of her lines from the skit, quote, it is not surprising that when men speak, 
They speak about the inspiring influences of foxes and fields with an even when an even more interesting and deeper form of nature often sits across from them at the breakfast table. Likely, these same men do not raise their eyes from the pages of a book to explore the natures of the human souls immediately before them, their life companions, their children, their aged parents, their interest in these human creatures often does not exceed a concern about the next cup of coffee." End quote. Carol played Margaret Fuller with soul. Carol lived her entire life with soul. Sorry. <laughs> Carol and I first met at the Democratic Resource Center in 2005, where we both began. Carolyn, you muted yourself again. <laughs> it's okay. We'll get there. Why is that? I'm going to start over. <laughs> Carol and I first met at the Democratic Resource Center in 2005, where we both began volunteering for, at the front desk and became better acquainted. We started joining activities within and outside of the resource center. Um, within and, oh, okay, for example, attending um, numerous state uh, conventions, Wisconsin state conventions, um, and also uh, picnics and house parties. Eventually, we became fast friends. We regularly had dinners at hooligans, attended concerts and plays, and took day trips, often with other friends. For a number of years, Carol and I drove from, to Spring Green, Wisconsin, to view uh, several plays by the actors of the American Players Theater. These were always three-day adventures and so much fun. We always visited one per in particular bookstore that Carol introduced me to. And also, um, we spent probably at least an hour or two there in one day and then went back another day. Carol and I made three European uh, tours of two weeks each, always very spectacular. One, the, our first trip was to uh, was a tour of Turkey, and the next year we went to Prague. The following year we were with two other uh, friends and went to um, Austria, uh, pra, um, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. We had a, a wonderful time, um, and uh, okay. Carol and I, okay, we made that. And we, um, we were a perfect duo as roommates. Uh, no TV viewing, reading before sleep, and lights out early. We occasionally had group dinners at each other's homes. And Carol so much enjoyed joining my, my, da my daughters, my granddaughters, and me at my home for many Thanksgiving and Christmas celebrations. She was a wonderful addition to the table. Carol had many qualities, many attributes as a human, human being. Uh, her unique personality, her wit, her laughter, her general uh, generosity, her openness, her enthusiasm, her, uh, I can't read my writing, I should have my glasses on. Uh, her marvelous poetry, her vast knowledge of history and books in general, especially nonfiction, and so much more. I 
I miss my dear friend. If I had to describe Carol in one word, it would be feisty, which according to the dictionary is a person who's relatively small, lively, determined, and courageous. Other synonyms are spirited, plucky, gutsy, and spunky. Carol was all of these, and of course, much more. I don't remember where I first met her, it was probably in coffee hour after church. As I recall, she came up to me and introduced herself and she made very sure that I understood that her first name was spelled with an E at the end. And then she asked me bluntly what I thought about a political issue. I don't remember which issue she raised that day because this was not a one-time event. Uh, but one that recurred with great frequency. She was a tiger about politics, definitely a liberal Democrat, very sure about her opinions, difficult to convince otherwise, but eager to discuss and usually and luckily in agreement with my views. She was very active in the local Democratic Party until something offended her, I don't know what, and then she simply dropped out. Such was her way. Carol had many undying loves, as you've heard. Theater, music, art, and travel were high on that list. I frequently saw her at plays and concerts and exhibits. And after such an event, she loved talking about it, praising it for its merits, and never hesitant about criticizing its failures. As travel was her delight, Oh, and travel was her delight. I remember many times talking with her about where she had last been and who she had traveled with. She was very clear about who was a good traveler and who was not. I also knew Carol through the Eau Claire Buddhist Sangha. She was a meditator, a fact probably not too many of you knew. For sometimes she attended our meetings, sat upon her specially made meditation bench, and added her insights to our discussions of the Dharma. Frequently a bit skeptical, but always appreciative of the value of meditating. She stopped coming because her allergies made it difficult for her to cope with the odors arising from our old location. But she and I frequently discussed meditation. Despite her strong opinions, Carol had a host of friends Counting myself among them, I understand her having so many friends as a result of her warmth, humor, and honesty. You always knew where you were with Carol. There was no pussyfooting around about issues, but she was warm and caring. If I had a problem or a difficulty, I knew she would be empathetic and supportive as she offered whatever help she could give. I don't know how to describe her humor. Quirky, I guess. I, I remember when uh, she knew she was going to say something funny, she would look at me sideways out of the corner of one eye with this little smile on her face so that I knew a witty twist of some sort was coming. Above all, Carol was a poet. She loved words, imaginative com combinations, capturing emotion and a scene. Sometimes her poetry and politics came together as in the following. I defend my right to defy, defile, and defeat that degenerate, dishonorable, thunderhead, Scott Walker. <laughs> in the days when Carol was in hospice, I visited her only to find that much of who she was was gone, but not her love of poetry. She and I took turns reading Mary Oliver aloud, and her passion for words was alive and well in the room. Despite occasional bouts of depression, Carol was a vibrant, quirky, interesting person, and I will miss her.
Let me turn now to another of Carol's poems called Saxophone, which captures much of what we've said about her as only poetry can, briefly and evocatively. Carol writes, I was at a service when we had a jazz program. This is what I wrote. I have always loved the music of a saxophone. It speaks poetry to me and tempts my body to move in song. The saxophone was banned by the Protestant church in the age of jazz. Its shape is that of a snake and its music is tempting. The church declared it to be the devil's music. The saxophone's music imitates the human voice and can express a range of emotion. It was ruled that music from a saxophone entices people to perform sinful acts, such as dancing and moving their bodies in time to the music. One day, the man I married said, Carol, I think that someday you will run off with a saxophone player. <laughs> That's good. My name is Martha Munger, and I'm going to read another of Carol's poems. This one is Europa and the Bull written in 2018. In the painting by Alvar, the god Zeus is a white bull carrying Europa on his back. She is winding flowers through his horns and he is showing pleasure. In the story, the god Zeus looked down on Europa and desired her. He turned himself into a white bull and joined her father's herd. Europa saw him, climbed on his back. They traveled to Crete. Imagine a God, one who grants your desires and satisfies all your needs. Hi, I'm Leslie Fredrickson. And I was in Carol Johnson's sometimes, sometimes unsanctioned chalice circle. And then also we enjoyed the meetup at BAM together with our group there. And everything is making me smile because all these memories are so Carol. Um, I was asked to read a piece by Harry Messer that also is very Carol. From arrogance, pompousness, and from thinking ourselves more important than we are, may some saving sense of humor liberate us. For allowing ourselves to ridicule the faith of others, may we be forgiven. From making war and calling it peace, special privilege and calling it justice, indifference and calling it tolerance, pollution and calling it progress, may we be cured. For telling ourselves and others that evil is inevitable while good is impossible, may we stand corrected. God of our mixed up, tragic, aspiring, doubting and insurgent lives, Help us to be as good as in our hearts we have always wanted to be. Go, Carol. If Carol could teach us anything more, it might be this day, this perfect day we saw in Leslie's frame out there with the wind and the sun. It demonstrates the, the cycle of life, um, that which lives, that which comes into existence, it dies and also passes away. The star, the mountain, the continent. While our lives are brief sparks in this cosmic dance, they are precious. In the words of Duncan Howlett, life is worth living. It is good and beautiful in spite of the tra tragedy with which it is forever beset. We glory in life, undergirded by the faith that its goodness is pervasive, that it is a part of the texture of life, that it is the essence and nature of things. This is a profound faith, this confidence in life, 
more profound than perhaps we suspect because it stands upon faith and faith alone. No proof of it, no objective test to support it, except living of life itself. And perhaps this is the best test of all. And we go on strong in the faith that life is somehow good, no matter what befalls us, we do the right, the true and the good, giving the life that we have been given to give, however difficult that can be. And in that life, we can celebrate Carol, and celebrate her dedication to being passionate about uh, books and learning and politics and people and doing the right thing. And she, she was unafraid to use her voice and to use her words and to use her spirit to help people and to spread, um, to spread goodness in the world. We have bid farewell to Carol. It is done. Let us honor her in the days and years ahead by being living memories, by living in the moment, finding joy in the beauty of nature, in the twinkle of an eye, that side glance that uh, Virginia mentioned, and especially cherishing the life that we had in one another. Loving kindness is what Carol wanted us to live by. And now Tim and Karen Hirsch are going to sing Meditation on Breathing. Well, um, it was Carol's wish to encourage people to live with loving kindness. This song is for Carol. May, May I be filled, I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be, I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be, I be peaceful and at ease. May I be whole. May, May you be you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be you be filled with loving kindness. May
the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. Commitment. These we These carry, we carry in, our in our heart until we are together again. Imagine by John Lennon. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all of the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No greed, no need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. Go in peace and go in love. And those in Zoom, we will be sharing shortly um, our joys and concerns and, and memories over our virtual coffee here in the reception. <laughs>